Thanks so much for having me. Um, I need to do just a little bit of scene setting. So I am um, an associate professor in the Research Institute at Geisinger, which is a large integrated healthcare system um, spanning central and northeast Pennsylvania, including where we are sitting now, for those of us who are in person. Um, and I'm a, an ethicist and a legal scholar by training, importantly not an AI ethicist, so be gentle. Um, but in my spare time, I run, I co-run um, a behavioral insights team. And we were, uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today is one of our projects that implicated or raised some questions of AI transparency. In particular, what if anything to tell patients about the role of AI, predictive AI, in um, identifying them as at high risk for various conditions. Okay, so Geisinger, like many health systems, most health systems, uh, is increasingly using different forms of AI for different purposes. Um, for example, they have partnered with Medial Early Sign to develop a set of machine learning algorithms, which they call algo markers, uh, to identify high risk patients. And these are often used to close what we call care gaps, um, cancer screening, that type of thing. Um, and so, for example, uh, the lower GI algorithm predicts high risk of GI disease and colon cancer. Um, it happened to win second place in the 2021 CMS AI challenge. I had nothing to do with that, of course. Um, my team was asked to work on the, the post-algorithm development implementation of the flu marker, um, which was developed in 2020, so bad, good, bad timing. Um, the flu marker predicts likelihood of flu diagnosis and flu complications uh, up to and including hospitalization and even death, conditional on being unvaccinated. And it was trained and validated on nine years of EHR data at Geisinger uh, from about 641,000 Geisinger patients, and it uses over 2,000 EHR inputs. Um, and we thought that it was important that if Geisinger had a good faith belief that patients were at high risk for bad outcomes, that it was important to tell them that. But that in turn, given that this new way that Geisinger decided how people were at high risk involves AI, it raised the further question of what, if anything, to say about the role of AI in this prediction. And we didn't have a whole lot to go by, by way of model, um, because even though health systems are using AI increasingly, they, generally speaking, are not um, telling patients about it. Moreover, some experimental lab work has found that there is something called algorithm aversion, where people are averse to predictions made by algorithms, perhaps if they, especially if they see them make a mistake or they believe that an algorithm has made a mistake. Um, and certainly lots of people will feel that they're very healthy. And what do you mean I'm at high risk for flu complications? I'm very healthy. So we were worried that people, there could be this sort of credibility issue. On the other hand, more recent lab, also lab, experimental lab work, has found that actually, no, the first paper is wrong. Um, people appreciate algorithms. So that's fun, right? So if the first set of folks are right, you know, we worried that people might dismiss a transparent message um, that AI has predicted that they're at high risk, and that would undermine our primary mission of individually and for public health reasons, increasing uptake of flu vaccinations, which is a system priority and a community priority. Um, on the other hand, if the second group of, of behavioral scientists are right, well, maybe being transparent would be a twofer because maybe they would actually uh, extra embrace, maybe the AI transparency would give it a boost. So we conducted a series of three pragmatic RCTs across three flu seasons. Um, we also conducted a fourth RCT in year three to identify the optimal modality for, for communicating this information. I'm not gonna talk about that. Collectively, those four RCTs touched um, over 100,000 unique participants. And so I'll show you the year one results now. So first, Geisinger's patients were risk stratified according to this algorithm. The top 10% of risk were sort of lopped off and called high risk. They were, um, the, the 10th decile had about a 10% chance of conditional and not being vaccinated on having something bad happen to them. Um, at the top, the first decile was upwards of 90, 97%, or sorry, so I think it was more like 79%, slight dyslexia there. Um, so a bit of a range, but we were careful to figure out a meaningful, um, a meaningful cutoff for high risk. And we randomized participants into one of four 
conditions in the year one study. So people in the passive control condition didn't hear anything special from us. They got all the usual system messages, which are quite a lot, about we have a flu drive-in clinic this Saturday and you can get your flu shot at this specialty clinic and this primary care clinic and so forth. Those randomized to the high risk um, condition were told that they were at high risk for flu-related complications unless they got vaccinated and they were urged to get vaccinated. Those in the high-risk medical conditions were further told that according to a review of their medical records, that analysis indicated that they were at high risk. And then finally, in the algorithm arm, they were told that a computer-based algorithm analysis of their medical records indicated that they were at high risk. So on the y-axis, this is simply the percentage of patients who were vaccinated in each arm. And there are the results. Um, the, all the asterisks, and I'll have the p-values here, they're all p less than 0.05 or, or then some. Um, what you see here is that all three treatment arms in the colors are all significantly different from the passive control. So it worked. Um, you'll notice the effect size is not huge. Welcome to nudging uh, in the real world as opposed to in the literature. Um, so they were all significant, but for our purposes, what you see among the three colored bars is that there are no statistically significant differences among them. So rather than experiment, or sorry, rather than algorithm aversion or algorithm appreciation, we observe what might be called algorithm indifference. So they did not, they didn't seem to be punished for it. They also weren't, um, it wasn't a, a helpful boost either. Okay. In year two, we thought, you know, all this talk about explainable AI, and maybe you would get the boost of, of AI if you could do something to help people um, understand why. And so many all had the, uh, these reasons that they actually called, but why? But why am I at high risk? These but why reasons. And so in year two, for everybody who was randomized to either the medical records condition or the AI condition, they were further randomized to receive either one or three reasons that were unique to them. Although, as you can see, these are fairly broad categories. So things like medicines, um, you know, conditions related to breathing, oxygen levels, things like that. Okay, and so those are, that's an example of the letter. These, medal these messages went out, um, everyone got a letter. If you were signed up for the patient portal, you also got a patient portal message. If you signed up in your contact preferences for text messaging, you also got that. So everyone got one to three modalities of messages. There's the example of, of all of them there. Okay, here are the results. The first thing to note is there are now five bars instead of four. That's because we added an active control in year two. And just by the by, incidentally, if you look, if you compare the gray bar to the left to the black bar, to the three treatment color bars, what you see is that about half the effect of these nudges comes from the risk information itself. The other half simply comes from reminding people that it's flu season and that they can get their flu shot. So the active control simply did that. It did not say anything about um, people being at high risk. So you can see that the risk information is helpful even above and beyond an extra reminder above what this, the system already does in the passive control. But again, what you see is the same pattern of results from year one. So the, the far two bars, the golden bar and the let's call it a teal bar at the far right, those folks all had either one or three reasons, and yet they are still not significantly better, really different than the high risk only arm. Um, and moreover, you'll observe perhaps that directionally the AI arm is directionally a little bit worse, but again, that's not um, a significant difference. Finally, finally, we asked about a, a different set of groups, a different set of patients, which is the next decile down of risk, um, which might have very different perceptions of their own risk, uh, and so forth and so on. We ran the exact same five conditions, and we saw the same pattern of results again, with no significant differences among the three experimental arms, um, but directionally the AI arm being worse. So what do we conclude from this? Um, over three consecutive years across two deciles of risk stratification, high risk patients likelihood of getting a flu shot was not significantly affected by whether they were told that the risk status was based on AI or not, though directionally it was a bit worse. Giving patients one or three fairly specific personalized reasons derived from the algorithm 
Um, why they were at high risk also made no difference, we saw from year two. Now, we measured actual behavior in a pragmatic setting, unlike the lab studies that I showed you before, so that's good. But this isn't a direct measure of people's attitudes about health AI, of course. And even if it had been, the results might have been very different in any number of other healthcare contexts. Um, for instance, the standard of care here is that everybody six months of older um, at Geisinger is told <laughs> repeatedly, as Jen can <laughs> attest, employees must get their flu shot. Uh, it's required for us, and they are really hammered. Um, that message is hammered home. So the standard of care, the AI prediction, does not change the standard of care or what rec um, medication is recommended, nor does it affect who gets it. There isn't a triage, except for the fact that, yes, people at high risk get our fabulous nudge messages, um, which have a very modest but st st statistically significant impact on, uh, on uptake. So the, this work did result in a new standard of care at Geisinger um, for reasons I don't have time to explain. Um, the standard of care is at the top 15% of risk stratified patients are now told about their risk status, e status each flu season and encouraged to vaccinate. Um, but that campaign uses the high risk only arm. That's the one that simply says you are at high risk. You can lower your risk by getting vaccinated. Here's how you can do that. Um, and so it doesn't use the AI arm uh, in, for one reason, because it was directionally worse. And so that, of course, raises the question, is that problematic? Is it problematic that patients are no longer told that AI is involved in this prediction? And in answering that question, I'll just leave you with a further one. Does that, the answer to that question matter? Um, does it matter that the machine learning algorithm is more precise then it, it, it outperforms two other plausible models, an age and sex only model and a WHO inspired age, sex and some comorbidities model. And or does it matter, sorry to not have time to go over this table, does it matter that compared to the way Geisinger had been identifying high risk people, which is just accrued if you're 65 and older, you're high risk. If you're under that, you're not. Um, it is overall much less biased, especially after matching for age, but even before then, than that alternative method of prediction. Thanks to NIH and the NBR Roybal Center for funding and all my collaborators. Thank you.